<laughs> oh, it's already going up. Hey. Going there. Good morning. Good morning. Aaron, you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Bree. Hi, Carter. We haven't seen each other. Yeah. It's been too long. Meeting of the mind. I had a baby eight weeks ago, so that's fun and different. I thought I was going to ask. I figured, I thought that there was something going on, and I recall that, <laughs> that was something, something going on. <laughs> <laughs> did it take the normal nine months, or did you get it done quicker? No, I took the normal nine months, but I only took five days off after he got here. So. Ah. My mom took eight months with me. And I still came in at like eight and a half pounds. I just shared a link on a A draft up. Alan. Alan. Salty. Karen. What are you salty about? This is not the hat I was going to wear. I am sitting in the KOA hallway, like trying to find a quiet, like a space that I'm not going to wake campers up at 6 30 in the morning. <laughs> You're I thought like some of the common rooms would be open for me to go into and all of them are locked. So I was like, well, there's a hallway here. So this works. <laughs> Give a couple more people a chance to join here. I put a link in for a document that uh, I currently am the sole author of, which I don't like doing because I we would, wanted to be a little bit more organized for this thing that is a little bit ad hoc. Um. And so it may all be crap, but it is the beginning of a document around what we're calling a reference architecture. Um, but let's give other people a chance to join. And I am recording this for everybody so everybody knows that. This so case, you and Aaron made it home safely? We did. Aaron, you got a direct flight? Yeah, I have a direct flight to Little Oklahoma. Nice. <laughs> from from Dulles or DCA? DCA. Okay. That's I, a hard I, thing to come to. What I about you, our, Carter? I guess one of our senators lobbied for that. <laughs> it's pretty common that they do that. I, I... <laughs> like, it happened like two years ago or something, but I don't know. If That's you have a direct flight route, it's a very interesting dynamic if you... There was a time I was spending more time in D.C. and that you could and it just so happened the particular flight that I had ended on was either the one going to or back at the beginning or end of the week. And it was interesting to see where everybody sat. <laughs> it's like, like, whole thing. like one senator would always sit in the front in first class and the other one would never sit in first class. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And, Even if he could, like, got upgraded, he's like, no, I'm not. Right. Aren't they? That, that he purposely did not, even though he was getting upgraded. And, yeah. then, mm -hmm. and then one time, a senator and two key donors were in first class, and I was right next to him. They got shit-faced drunk and were talking about how they were going to raise money to cause for his their campaign to get something done. I mean, they basically were having a conversation drunk in first class about 
something on the edge of illegal in terms of capital for funding. It's like this is weird. Anyway. Are they yeah are they concerned about are they concerned? Are they concerned about whether they're sitting on the left or the right of the plane? I don't know. I don't know if I got it. <laughs> but fore and aft, it was it was different. Anyway, okay. I think we're well. Now Aaron's left, and is Katie on? Katie is not on. Where is Katie? I don't know. I thought this worked for her, but maybe it didn't. Yeah, if you're up early, uh, <laughs> why don't we just start? with some of the folks that are here um, to just do a quick introduction. And I can, uh, we got a bunch of different folks, but, um, and then we'll finish up with Aaron and Ellen. Uh, but uh, David, you want to go first? Sort of call. Sure. You. Make sure you're the kind of thing if you're, just a quick introduction on who you are. Uh, David Lazak's managing director of Food System 6, primarily working on the intersection of finance and transitions to regenerative agriculture, but have a couple of threads dealing with uh, the relationship between food and health as well. Great. Uh, Bree? Hi, everybody. Bree Lowry Cox. I am based in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I am a senior advisor at GRC Advising, a global social impact management consultancy. Um, I advise Appalachian Regional Healthcare, the largest provider of care in central Appalachia, and also uh, am part of a $20 million climate smart commodities grant. What's relevant for us here is that ARH is leaning hard into uh, food as health, food as medicine as a system taking care of very sick people. Great. Derek? Morning, everybody. <laughs> Derek Jeevan, part of Innovation Business Development, uh, at, at least the role that pays me at Winfield United, uh, but I'm very active in the startup arena, presently focusing on a couple of startups that are trying to add value as, as food is medicine through AI and early early, you know, generational change from two-year-old to five, how they can integrate good eating habits and hoping to learn here and see how we can work together. Thank you. Great. Uh, Steve? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, the invitation. Uh, my name is Steve Brazil. I have a company called Sunterra Produce. So fundamentally, we're a grower, packer, and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the two initiatives that drew me to this group are Elevated Foods. Um, we, too, are the recipient of a $20 million grant from USDA under the Climate Smart uh, Partnerships to work with fresh fruit and vegetable growers to help them more rapidly adopt uh, climate smart practices. And secondly, through an initiative, we have Project Food Box. We do two things. We partner with growers to move the hard to sell produce and work together with food banks to get those out into the community. And about two years ago, we began executing um, our version of medically tailored meals, which is um, farm fresh fruits and vegetables uh, built specifically to uh, address Medicaid members' chronic health conditions. Great. Dave? Yeah, hi, Dave Pavlik. I'm BP2 Health, um, along with Ellen and Justin here. We are a consulting firm. Um, we do a lot of things in the healthcare arena, but uh, we're, we're, we seem to be uh, uh, gravitating lately towards uh, payment transformation, um, all things kind of accountable care um, and, uh, and, and the like. I have a background in, um, started my career on the healthcare payer side. Um, provider uh, network uh, network operations um, and provider networks, et cetera, um, moved on into some roles in IT and data analytics. So I'm kind of a hybrid of a um, an analytics guy and an operations guy. Cool. Justin? Yeah, Justin Politti, um, as David mentioned, with uh, both he and Alan, um, I guess I'm the operations aspect of BP2. Um, we are, when I say that, well, you know, we are focused on innovative technologies and uh, value-based arrangements. And um, so basically looking at how do we practically look at implementing these, these approaches, um, knowing the healthcare system, you know, my background was, you know, multiple years at United Healthcare and other health insurance companies um, prior to working at BP2 Health. Um, so yeah, that's my background. Excited to be part of this. Cool. Uh, Dalton? Hey, good morning. I'm Dalton Hatfield, the Director of External Affairs for Appalachian Regional Healthcare, 14 hospital system, 95 clinics in Southern West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky. Um, 
leaning in on food as medicine to improve health outcomes in Central Appalachia. Cool. Eva? Hi, everyone. I'm Eva Tucker. I work closely with Carter at Iflex Fund, um, supporting our marketing and communications, as well as um, supporting building our networks in food and agriculture. Great. And health. Derek? Derek's on sorry, mute. Carter, did you want me to go again? Oh, I get, 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 get you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, did, you're, I was going by pictures and you were videoing off. And so I was. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, what else? So I've got this board to get, and the board keeps moving around. So I can't keep track of where everyone is. Ellen? On mute. Don't know how to use technology. Ellen Brown, BP2 Health. As uh, Justin and Dave said, so. Basically, we have been involved in the OG of healthcare, always trying to push change. About a year ago, I was about pretty much done with healthcare and just tired of the lack of movement. I've always been a closet health hacker and food lover and have had all this information like on the side that I knew was tragic for everything and we needed to link the two. And finally, I feel like we've gotten to this cataclysmic point where food and health and not just food is medicine, but food is health is at a crossroads where we can connect the dots. I made a really intentional choice to put myself out in healthcare in a way that we weren't just doing basic payment transformation of ACOs like everybody else, but we would find a way to link those doing really creative things in the industry to reverse, I, I don't want to sound like a zealot of trying to make the world healthy and have health insurance companies pay for it because that's not realistic, but we do need to reverse lifestyle disease and we do need to make it so that folks don't really want to go down that path, right? It's, it's easy for them to be healthy. And so I made a really intentional choice to position us to get involved with those types of things. And I ran into Carter and I ran into Aaron and I ran into Bree and a bunch of people on this call. And, uh, We've, I feel like we've got some really exciting momentum and a lot of really great ideas and um, here I am. So I'm, I'm gunning for it. And we have a podcast that we put folks out there to talk change, even Dave and Justin now to eat, eat super healthy because of the, the call with Carter in part. So, I mean, the, the podcast episode we did with Carter. So yeah, super, uh, super excited to be on today. I guess we're kind of the annoying healthcare people, not the fun <laughs> food people. And by the way, Aaron... <laughs> I had to let you know that Colby is here by spirit. He's on vacation, but Colby, the actuary that we love, would have joined. I already posed to Aaron and to Carter. I've already posed to him the extinction event question. And if he didn't have small children when he was on vacation, I think he would have already answered it by now. So. <laughs> okay. I, there's something there I don't understand, but we'll figure it out. Aaron. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Erin Martin. Uh, I'm the founder and director of a produce prescription program in Oklahoma. We only source local and regeneratively grown produce for people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, we just expanded to serve one of the native nations uh, that is funded through the Indian Health Services federally. We are also funded through the USDA. Um, yay to all the people who got the Climate Smart grants. That's fantastic. Our conservation partner for the for Oklahoma got one of the smaller climate smart grants. So we collaborate really closely with agriculture, but we also produce incredible health outcomes. Um, as a result of this program, I became a national keynote speaker on connecting the quality of soil health to human health outcomes. Um, and then last year, I won a team of lawyers from Harvard to convene a food as medicine policy coalition for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we have about 100 members in there. We're trying to pass an 1115 waiver that includes food as medicine for people on state Medicaid. Um, there are about 14 states that have done this already. So yeah, tons of momentum. Carter and I got to testify before Congress three days ago. Um, yep. And yep. And so we are just, uh, you know, obviously we think that food is medicine or food is health. Um, if used properly and done properly, has a what Dr. Chin calls a health multiplier effect. I call it the ripple effect of using uh, health outcomes and money to go into food as health programs 
that also goes directly to the farmers as well. So really resurrecting rural economies at the same time as producing these health outcomes. So we're excited to try to get all these great minds together to, to figure this problem out. And Katie's on. Look, Katie came. Katie. I'm so sorry, you guys. It's one. Of, it's only 9.45 and I'm already backlogged. Like, sorry. Well, can you introduce yourself? I can. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Stebbins. I run the Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute and Boston Food Tech at Tufts University. And can you explain where Fried? I'm not sure many people know about Friedman. Can you just sort of... Yeah. So I'm hosted by the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy at Tufts. We are the only school of nutrition in the United States. So there's other departments of them at, at medical schools, et cetera, but we are the only freestanding school of nutrition in the United States. And uh, that came out of the White House Conference on Nutrition in like the first one that was like at the during the 40s or something. We got birthed out of that because Jean Mayer, who was the president of Tufts at the time, was inspired and did the White House conference with like Roosevelt or I don't know, and then gave way to the Friedman School. Yeah. Um, and that was Marky's, Marky actually went into that in some depth at uh, at the hearing. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm Carter Williams. I, I am part of the iSelect team. We are an investor in Food is Health. The theme oh. fund is around uh, that we spend 1.7 trillion on food in the US. 1.9 trillion on the healthcare cost of poor nutrition. And we now invest in ag tech and health tech with the idea to get that 1.9, the healthcare cost of poor nutrition of down. And so we are a tech investor. Um, I also have a bit of a history in aerospace and such, and have been involved in sort of big challenging kind of problems and recognized really through my interaction with Ellen and Aaron and Katie uh, and some others who aren't on the call, that there are a bunch of different people working on pockets of the problem of how do we get food as health to work. And my experience in working in big complex things like change how the military operates or change how aerospace works is that uh, sometimes you just got to get all those different groups of people to move to a common viewpoint of what the future might be. And, and they will figure out how to operate towards that. Uh, the geeks in the room call this a reference architecture, which is like what the IBM PC is an example of a reference architecture. So Microsoft came out and, and IBM said, here's the IBM PC and we'll do software this way and the PC this way, and all of a sudden, Gateway showed up, and Dell showed up, and HP showed up, and all these other companies sort of showed up around that system and and built it out. And when we look at the healthcare system, today's healthcare system was really a byproduct of what was called the Rockefeller model, which was, I think, in the early 20s. Somebody said, uh, okay, we got everybody getting healthcare based on witchcraft, which actually had sort of worked. Um, now what we need to do is a lot of research about how to improve care. And then we move to what now is the, uh, sick care model, so to speak. If you want, if you're sick, the best place in the world to be is the United States. If you want to avoid getting sick, it's probably not the United States. <laughs> uh, and so we've developed that. And so now can we go back to our roots a little bit and think about what was good about the healthcare, about food beforehand, what's the best of our healthcare system? And we can, we develop a new food is health oriented or food is medicine oriented kind of framework. So I, mean, Carter, I love that sentence you just said. I want to keep it somewhere, which is identify what's the best of our healthcare system. I think we always talk so much about what's horrible about it. We forget to recognize that there are pieces of it that are good that on a board, like on a whiteboard, you do have to create a bucket for that, that yes. I think we overlook. Yes. Um, and, you know, yes, if I had a aneurysm, I would. I would want to show up at Tufts pretty quick, uh, but uh, I don't necessarily want to go to my doctor if uh, I want to avoid getting diabetes. Um, I want to go to Aaron. <laughs> I want to avoid good, diabetes. I'm good at emergency medicine. If I break my arm, I'm not going to my herbalist. We're, we're good at 
we're good at pe keeping people alive. Yes. We have plenty of acute facilities to try to keep people alive. We don't focus on getting people back to health. That was my big conclusion with my mom earlier this year was you go to a hospital, they keep you alive. They send you home. You figure out how to get healthy again. Yeah, the, the story that I need to figure out how to tell well is uh, as kids, we tried to get my mother to stop smoking. And as adults, we tried to get my mother to stop smoking. And then she finally got cancer and she had concocted some version of why the type of smoking she was doing wasn't causing the cancer. But five minutes before she fell into a coma at her death, uh, she said, I probably shouldn't have smoked. So uh, it, nice. it would have been easier had she <laughs> reached that conclusion sometime before but but anyway so i think each of us have this story so um uh we decided in an ad hoc way sort of randomly we sort of being aaron alan katie me through various conversations to sort of pull together a conversation around well maybe we could come up with a bit of this is how the system might work and pull together an array of people around how the system might work and let everybody continue to operate that way. But over time, say, these are the features that integrate and these are the features that overlap and, and make people more aware. My job as a venture capitalist is I've probably seen 5,000 startups in the food is health space over the last 10 years. And I am reminded every day when I see some of those companies, how little they know about what their peers are doing, how passionate they are about the thing that they're doing, and how sort of disappointing in my role as an investor that 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 I have all this information about the possible interconnects, but I don't really have a mechanism to communicate it effectively because our our job is to invest in startups and help them. It's not to build the broader system. And so I come to this a bit to sort of say, like, I've got all this knowledge and observations that I don't know what to do with. I assume others are seeing something similar and I don't really want to invest in stuff that's really a, a friction of miscommunication between different systems. I really want to invest in things that help make the system better. Um, and so that's a little of my motivation pulling this together. Um, there are people missing from this. I think uh, I think because I forgot to invite them, uh, like Sherry Fiddler, who's at Farm Foundation. They've been very focused on, on rural agriculture. <laughs> Uh, we have some farmers that did not join that I think I missed them by mistake that have been very passionate. So this is this is a room full of not everybody that needs to be involved and and anyway. Um but so I'll shut up on that. Um I I would like to have Erin though uh go deeper into what she's up to in a little bit. Erin and I both testified this week at the Senate on the topic of food as medicine around medical tailored meals. And that was a conversation from the Senate Health Committee in which um, you may not know about this legislation. There's sort of three kinds of meetings that legislatures have. One is we're working on a bill. All you people that have in interest in here come in and have a fight and let's have that hearing. So that's, and then there's a second kind of hearing, which is um, all you lobbyists, why don't you show up and tell us what you should think about? And then there's the primary type of hearing that we went to, which is we don't know what legislation we're doing. Our ears are open. Can we have some people sit in the room and sort of give us a sense of what's the art of the possible? That was what the hearing was. The hearing was what might be the art of possible? What is working? What isn't working? Um, and my my sense from that hearing was there were every senator was there is like, we personally have a story about why food is health, food is medicine needs to be. We don't know how to solve it. We don't even know how to legislate it. What do you people think? Um, and Dari from Friedman was there. Uh, Dari and, and Katie are colleagues. Aaron was there and I was there. My role was really to say, here's the technology that's available. You don't need to reinvent it. Um, but Aaron's role was, I'm actually doing this on the ground and changing people's lives. Um, and so Aaron, I wouldn't mind if you sort of would explain what you're up to and what's working in food is health and food is medicine, maybe spend five or five or 10 minutes explaining your journey over the, over recent past. Sure. So just to give a little bit of background, um, and understanding of 
what food as medicine is. There's some different things within that. There's a triangle um, graph that's great that Tufts uh, created, but it, it looks at um, different food interventions that can be integrated and some that have been, been integrated into the medical <laughs> system. Um, so produce prescription and medically tailored meals are what you'll hear the most about. Uh, medically tailored meals are pre-prepared meals um, that are federally being paid for by Medicare um, to when people get discharged from the hospital. So as we know, um, kind of with the implementation and switch to value-based care, one of the things that the hospitals um, get deemed with is readmission rates. So providing <laughs> medically tailored meals, uh, three meals a day for 90 days is what is being paid for federally. The quality of these meals, um, I wouldn't say is incredible. There are some smaller uh, folks with the Food as Medicine Coalition, uh, more nonprofits that are really caring about quality in those meals and trying to come up with like a standard of excellence. Um, and then you have produce prescription, which is whole fruits and vegetables, um, that the aim is to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables um, in many different diet related diseases from type two diabetes to obesity, to high blood pressure, to some cancers, uh, cardiovascular disease. There's been about a thousand produce prescription programs that have been done nationally. Most have been funded by philanthropy. Uh, they do pilot programs, they fizzle out and there's no sustainable funding pathway. Um, we, we are lucky in Tulsa, Oklahoma with a lot of oil money. So we have a lot of philanthropy dollars that I was able to have raised pretty easily. They continue to support us. Um, so we, uh, how produce prescription works and how we do it is kind of an elevated and enhanced version. A lot of these programs focus just simply on food insecurity and they give vouchers to farmers markets is how these are kind of historically done and don't really measure health outcomes. Well, we've taken kind of the best of both worlds um, and created a, a more innovative model. Uh, we're compared to another program called Recipe for Health in California, who uh, that'd be someone else who should be at this table, Dr. Stephen Chin. Um, he is like who I'd like to grow up to be. He's already contracting with health payers. Uh, so doctors prescribe uh, produce. We provide uh, they have an actual prescription form that they fax to us. Uh, we have physicians from over 22 primary care clinics. Uh, we, we specialize in type 2 diabetics. They send this prescription over. We enroll them into the program, and they're automatically put into the program. We provide, we uh, curated kind of CSA um, a process for them to pick up or they get delivery. They get about $50 worth of produce every other week for an entire year for free. They also are required to go to cooking and nutrition classes, either online or in person. And then we measure their A1C weight and blood pressure every three months. Um, they get a starter kit when they start the program. Um, but we, I, from the very beginning, I was looking at sustainable pathways. And uh, one is through Medicaid, the 1115 waiver that is um, making this a billable um, item on insurance. We've talk to several health plans, um, even commercial health plans, um, and also uh, in the Medicare space, a lot of Medicare Advantage plans are kind of doing this too. Um, they're seeing people on commercial health plans who have obviously chronic conditions, but also are still food insecure. Um, and so we have a local insurance agency that has been talking to us. Um, and then on the farming side, we aggregate all that food ourselves. Since we don't really have a local food system, we've kind of built the local food system on the back of this program and made more local food available to the wider community. We've also commissioned more culturally appropriate crops for people we're serving who are predominantly black and indigenous. Um, so really trying to get more native varieties of food and getting growers to grow those and commissioning them to grow certain crops. We look at farmers using regenerative soil health practices um, and then we also help them scale their business uh, by connecting them to uh, share of cost funding with high tunnels through the NRCS. We work with the USDA and our Conservation Commission here. So we have helped these farmers scale dramatically. Uh, we've served about 27 small scale farmers using regenerative practices. And then if farmers come forward to us that aren't really using regenerative practices, we do support them with linking them to technical assistance to start using cover crops or stop tilling as much or other types of, of tools as well. 
sorry, I was on mute because the dog was going nuts. Um, so what's the outcome? The outcome is people can reverse their type two diabetes <laughs> in a really quick amount of time. Um, we have people who have like been diagnosed type two for a decade and then they, they join our program and they have results in weeks. Um, we've, uh, we've seen incredible shifts in A1C levels, our largest from like a 13 to a five. Um, we had someone lose 116 pounds, came off of all of her medications, and this happened within eight months. Um, but these are not unique situations. We have people that lose 20, 30, 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds um, frequently in this program. Um, people feel happier. They're not suicidal. We are measuring some mental health components with the health survey that we do. Uh, we've seen statistical, uh, significant statistical um, increase in consumption of garden salads and vegetable soups. We've seen a statistical correlation between increased consumption of fruits and vegetable and overall improved health. And we've seen a statistical significant uh, decrease in soda consumption by a result of being in this program. So incredible results. And then a community, like building a community. Um, a great example is when we had our graduation one year. We had farmers give testimony and patients give testimony. And for the patients and the farmers to connect, it's very reinvigorating. And it connects that community dot that's been so lost um, between all of us. And so why does it work? Well, Carter thinks it's empathy. <laughs> and um, or or what we could say uh, that be more business-esque would would be um, the customer experience. It works because the people are empowered and cared about. It doesn't feel like a handout. One of our participants was quoted on the news saying, it doesn't feel like a handout. It feels like come and get some longevity, uh, which I couldn't have put that in her mouth better. Um, yeah. So that was amazing. Um, and so it's the energy around the type of people. We have people serving people that have their own health experiences. So I have multiple people that are from that community on our staff that are look like the people we're serving um, who have also had huge weight loss um, and food uh, experiences and journeys. Uh, so they, they empathize with the participants. Uh, we also have hired participants. So they really understand the program and that it works. And they're in, it's really like a health coaching kind of feeling of like, we tell people like, you can do it. And it's amazing that like how much impact they, that has. And many participants have uh, testified that um, it hasn't been just the food. It's been the support and like the emotional support that's happened during the program. Aaron, oh, go ahead. A, a go quick ahead. question. Are you guys also charting any uh, decreases or improvements in hypertension as well? Or is it strictly diabetes? Yeah, we are uh, measuring their blood pressure. And so there has been there has been significant de uh, balances of, of of blood pressure. I was just gonna add one of the things, Carter, that you mentioned during your testimony, which I um, my background's in economic development, so I tend to always put things in terms of economic development, which is really a proxy for the word jobs. So in your testimony, Carter, you talked about uh, economic productivity lost through food being the leading cause of death in this country, and. And as I'm listening to you, Aaron, I'm thinking, what is that translation to economic productivity? Because I find I've been in politics for 20 years. And I always tell people in the health space, if you want to talk to the head of health and human services, talk about nutrition and food. If you want to talk to the mayor, the, the, the president, the governor, talk about jobs. And so you now there's articles all over saying, like, does the U.S. need a baby boom? We have a decreasing fertility rate. We have a decreasing birth rate. We don't have, we, people are so sick, we don't have enough people showing up to work. What's going to come of this US productivity? I think there's a bridge here of being able to clearly articulate the health crisis we're in around food with the crisis we're in with our workforce. And we're just not translating that well. And so while it should be enough to say, look at people who are finally healthy, embracing their lives. There's a world of people that want to hear, look at all these people who can now show up for work and be healthy and get yes. a new youth on life because they now don't have all these medications or not overweight. They can actually show up and be productive and maybe think about a career they never thought possible for themselves because physically they couldn't have even managed it. 
Um, so I just think there's a piece of this puzzle that is important if we're going to get all the people listening and investing in the right way. Cool. Other thoughts or questions? I'm just Man, it's overlap to other people's work and. Uh, I'll weigh in on the health side and say, so Dave and Justin and I have spent a lot of time talking about how to pull this off economically as part of a model of care delivery that would bring monetary incentives for those outcomes improvement and that cost of care savings all the way back to like the farmer. Like that to me would be the ultimate is exactly the program that Aaron's describing, but that being part of actually how care is delivered from the health insurance and the health system side, meaning a care model or right, like kind of these formal healthcare words and truly aligning it financially. So I think to me, what's really important is I, I really want to see this group figure out how to, I hate to say productize because I understand your point Carter of this is almost like an open source group, like where we're just trying to put all the information on the table so that we can, we can solve problems in different ways. But I think where, to me, where the disconnect happens is that health systems want to keep you alive, like we talked about, and health insurance companies want to keep it easy on their end. And they want, they want um, certainty. So if they're going to invest in something for their lives, for their members, right? They want to have certainty that it's going to save them money. Otherwise, it's just another expense. In addition, when it's just a small piece of how care is delivered, it becomes a solution that's in a big vat of a bunch of solutions. So Carter, you talk about the investments that you make in a lot of different companies. So like journeys, right? Like we, we talked to journeys metabolic the other day is an example, fantastic solution, but it's just one little solution to a health plan. And there are a bazillion in their mind, there are a bazillion solutions out there and it's a very noisy space. So what I want to see is for us to figure out a way to use an existing financial mechanism within healthcare to support doing this where you don't have to go out and try and get a contract at first. Like we can create a demonstration of success and, and give everybody in this system a, a financial reward for, for the success that Aaron you're describing and not have to be at the beck and call of an insurance company necessarily right now. So like I've mentioned to Carter, when we talk about Medicare, all those lives that are not in Medicare Advantage plans, for example, which is about half the population, they're all in fee-for-service Medicare. The government is just paying their claims. There are accountable care organization programs that we could tap into to create an accountable care organization that is centered around reversing lifestyle disease, for example. And then this, this accountable care organization would get half at least, depending on how it's structured, at least half of the savings generated back to the accountable care organization to be able to distribute to all of those that are part of this. Could you so, define, I'm not sure everybody knows what an ACO is, do you mind? Sure, so an ACO is sort of like a health plan in, in really simplistic terms. So when you think about a health insurance company, right, they get paid a premium dollar and then they pay for the care costs and then they they pay themselves to administer all the claims. So, claims. so they create a physician network, they have contracts with doctors and clinicians. I'm making this very oversimplified. Um, you join their health plan and then you pay a premium to insurance, right? Then for whatever care services that are defined as part of your benefits, you go to the network that they've created of doctors, they pay your claims, you pay whatever co-pay or co-insurance, right? All those things. Um, and that's how you get your health care. And the, the insurance company is responsible for that. So you guys got, you have What's that part, novel, right? What differentiates them versus the other? Well, system. right. I just want to set that as the foundation. So it's, it's premium dollar, right? And then claims paid. So that's the premise I want to put out there. So an accountable care organization is that, but underneath 
either the structure of a health insurance company or kind of in the wild. So on Medicare, right, the government is paying as if they were an insurance company for all of those claims for Medicare beneficiaries that are that are not enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. So the so CMS, the government is the insurer. So what they did was they created something called Accountable Care Organization uh, program, which is Medicare Shared Savings. You may have heard, you may have heard ACO Reach, you may now have heard ACO Flex. That's a new thing they're doing this year. There's different forms of it, but in essence, an entity is formed. And then that entity does the same thing an insurance company was. It creates a network of physicians that are contracted to participate. And then CMS, because, because people that have fee-for-service Medicare don't enroll in a health plan, right? They just go to the doctor. They just go to whatever doctor they want. In order to enroll those Medicare beneficiaries in said accountable care organization, as if it was a health plan, for example, they use what's called alignment, which can be in the form of voluntary, which is the beneficiary goes onto a web page and says, this doctor is my primary care physician, in which case then that beneficiary gets aligned or assigned to that doctor. And if that doctor is participating in an accountable care organization, then that person is attributed to that accountable care organization. And then CMS does this, you take your accountable care organization you created, you have all of the primary care physicians that have signed up to be part of this accountable care organization. And then they go through all the beneficiaries that are aligned through claims, right? They either look at their claims history to see if they've seen that doctor within a certain period of time or the voluntary alignment when one trumps the other. And then they get assigned as if it was a member, right? So again, you think about you sign up for a health plan, you become a member. In this case, you're assigned as if you were a member to this accountable care organization. And then the accountable care organization, because the beneficiary doesn't pay an insurance fee, the government creates what's called a benchmark, which in essence is like, it's like premium revenue. And it's a target of how much it would have cost the government to pay all of the claims for these beneficiaries. So you say you have a hundred beneficiaries that are assigned to your ACO, and it was going to cost $1,200 historically per member per month for these people that were assigned to you, the ACO. Then what happens is throughout the year, government says, okay, how much did we actually pay for these people? And whatever the delta is, so let's say it was going to cost $1,200, and now you in your ACO, because of the things you're doing, it was only 1000 your ACO, depending on how it's structured, is going to get anywhere from that $100 down to half of that, as long as you've hit a certain savings threshold. It's all, you know, very technical, like government loves to do that. Um, and then that's your money to keep, the accountable care organization. You can give it back to your physicians. You pay yourself for, you know, running your ACO. You can give it to the farmers. Um, you can't really give it back to the beneficiaries. Thank you, Marshall. Members of the HELP Committee. So that's, does that... I, and I'm sorry to yeah, try so me, and keep it me, high level, but. Just one other thing I'd like to add in just to what Alan's saying is right now we know that, you know, there's not CPT code coverage for, you know, food as medicine services under Medicare fee for service. But in this, in this ACO, in these ACO programs, they're called benefit enhancements and benefit beneficiary engagement incentives that allow for you to, they're waivers, right, of, you know, existing, you know, federal requirements and there's flexibility within those components that will allow for this the creativity, like to Ellen's point, around what the group's trying to achieve within some of those programs. Um, until such time that Met, at Medicare fee for service does pay for it. Yeah. So to put this in a context. Um, one, how many people here knew all that? Okay. <laughs> so um, it's sort of a geeky thing, but it's an example of perhaps things that can come together. So I believe, Aaron, you if you reduce somebody's A1C by two or three points, it saves the health care how much? There is an article done by Geisinger Food Pharmacy Study that states that a one to two point reduction in a year would save sixteen to $24,000 a year per, for health care costs. Well, and I was going to add 
I was going to add that I was just accepted into a uh, national work group to develop coding for food as medicine for billing codes. It's called coding for food okay. uh, for produce prescription. And they're going to develop coding billing codes for produce prescription and medically. They're trying to differentiate between medically tailored meals and produce prescription with the coding. So, so this 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 is like an example. It's highly geeky here. So let me just sort of simplify a little bit. Um, an example of the kind of things we see when we talk to the 5,000 entrepreneurs is there's one group over here that says, hey, care delivery is trying to figure out how to make a lot of savings and then take that savings and either turn it into their own profit or to pay the supply chain for helping make that savings. So there's money over here. And then there are people on the other side in farming, perhaps, that are saying, I'm not getting paid enough to do this kind of work. And then there are other things, you know, there are other, a whole bunch of things in between changing. Now, in Aaron's case, if she's in Oklahoma and she has for $3,000 for three thousand for the program that you run, typically, Aaron. Say one more time. Your program sort of runs its course for about three thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. So and so she can run her program for about three thousand dollars, and Oklahoma Medicaid Medicare can save itself perhaps twenty to twenty four thousand, sixteen thousand to twenty four thousand, or whatever that number is. Yeah, they took so. Took the first 52 patients we saw, uh, the University of Oklahoma, they took that data and they scaled it to like 1,200 people. And they said it would cost us $3 million to serve the 1,200 people, but it would save in 25 million in healthcare costs. So um, if you can use those numbers or just a per person number, whatever, but the, the de delta here that as you know, more of the economic person in me sort of says, it's then the motivation of Medicare to save the twenty sixteen to twenty two thousand dollars, and and in its current beta form, Aaron can do that for three. There, in normal economics, it says Aaron, as the entrepreneur, should be able to make a bunch of money on this and solve the problem that the healthcare system has, and and that sort of gets to the reference architecture. Is we we still want we want economic things to go on here. We want Aaron to be able to run her program and grow it and to take those profits and use them in some fashion, that delta, that savings, use it in some fashion. I, I'm not even profit or or expansion or or whatever. I don't, that's not the thing, but the, the, we've got a delta here. And the delta is separated probably in part because Aaron's not an expert in ACOs. And Ellen, who's an expert in ACOs, has absolutely no idea exactly how to deliver the care and and uh our friends at aarh and brie like are sitting running a healthcare system and i gotta put some words in your mouth and you add this of the comorbidity of diabetes is making it so you can't treat cancer <laughs> so and you can't hire enough endocrinologists to sit on the cancer ward so your whole system's a mess for various reasons, enough that you you are so upset with the situation that you're willing to step in and, again, I'm putting words in your mouth, you're willing to step in and cut down diabetes, despite the fact that you get paid for it, cut down diabetes so that you can do your main mission, which is probably to prevent cancer, which people can't solve on their own. Um, and so, again, this is like uh, the, a little bit of what we're after here is we've got these frictions going on that the others aren't aware that, oh, wait a second, Aaron can help solve this problem really effectively for me. But and Aaron sitting is like, I don't have enough money to do this to scale and I got to go out to get grants. And there's an economic interest by economic players here to just pay her better to do it um, because they'll save money. So, um Carter, can I can I add one more angle? Add a lot so, more. So, okay. <laughs> so I think what's interesting, and when we think about the ACO and the relationship to CMS, I'm going to call on Dalton to pepper in here as well. ARH is a nonprofit healthcare system, which is largely rep largely representative of many of the systems across the nation. So that you know, CMS is reimbursing, but ARH is eating it out of pocket to try to save some money in a very very simplified way. To the 
point about productizing things, I'm going to share um, a little graphic that is ARH's Food is Medicine Pyramid. And this is what um, they were referencing, the Tufts Pyramid. ARH is systematically filling this in across their service area by region, by topic. This is all piecemealed, but it is making healthcare impact out. It is impacting healthcare outcomes. So Dalton, you've been a party to a lot of how this has come together, but as we break these pieces out, they all have different workflows. They all have different partners. They all have different costs. And you know what? Total, we're looking at a total cost of under a million for all of these things for 12 months, but yet we are piecing them together community by community, region by region. Dalton. No, you're, you're spot on Brie. And, um, you know, going back to, it's kind of a tangled web uh, for everybody involved, right? And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of things that that are happening in different spheres outside of healthcare that, um, you know, we can, can use uh, a lot of things that you folks are doing that we can use to improve health outcomes. And, you know, whenever you talk about uh, our system and the geographic area that we serve and the demographics that we serve, um, we're serving, you know, 80 to 85 percent government payers. So, you know, patients that are on Medicaid, uh, lower income and, and have um, barriers to um, improved health outcomes and, and, you know, accessing just basic care. And so, you know, looking at the social determinants of health and seeing how we can, you know, not just address food insecurity and not just um, you know, get food, boxed food into the, you know, hands of the people that need it, but getting the right foods into the hands of the people that need it. Um, you know, we're partnering with our new agriculture commissioner here in, in Kentucky, uh, who is taking a major step in, you know, forming a food as medicine uh, task force uh, with our hospital association. And so, you know, we're just a very small ripple in a large wave um, that, you know, could be replicated, um, you know, nationwide in order to, um, you know, improve these health outcomes. But no, Brie, you hit the, hit the nail on the head there. So, so, so question, oh, sorry. Uh, I just want to ask a question on data because 80% uh, mm -hmm. was mentioned of your enrolled patients. I'm trying to understand from a population health standpoint, because we're talking about people enrolled in government programs and I'm trying to understand the total pop, total U.S. population of people enrolled in some sort of healthcare intervention, and what percentage of those are enrolled in a federal government subsidized program, and which are not? Like I'm, I'm just trying to get my hands around like because there's a whole other world of people who aren't enrolled, right? So, and I and I don't know how we're. I'm I'm just trying to understand like the world of healthcare. And we've, we're very doubled down, obviously, on the high risk social determinants of health population. But when you're talking, Ellen, about financial or financial vehicles that solve problems, I'm also wondering, is there an economies of scale that we lose because we're so deeply segmenting this? That's so you've you have articulated what. I want this group to help drive, Katie, is changing it. I feel like we're we're all these one-offs, and Carter hit on this at the beginning. We have all of these sort of variations on a theme and chasing different grant dollars, different pieces, right? It's like on the peripheries. I mean, Bree and Dalton just put that, you know, visual up to show and I can the million dollars, Brie, that you talked about, I'm sure is painstakingly difficult to come by um, because of how, because of that social determinants of health. Everybody talks a good game. Those companies are all going by the wayside because again, they don't have the return. So right. what I, that's why I keep pushing. So for example, I don't think that accountable care organizations are the end all be all by any means but to me, they're the vehicle, the lowest risk, the lowest downside financial risk, the least capital to create, right? There's no, this is the big thing. There's no insurance reserves required for an accountable care organization and Medicare under the Medicare Shared Savings Program. 
you don't have to have insurance reserves if you're in the lowest track and you only have, you have no downside risk. Okay. That's huge. If, if we created a program and we wanted to take, you know, financial risk for a population, you'd have to have insurance reserves. That changes the game of the conversation we're having. So to your point, Katie, what I'm trying to do is say, we have real outcomes. Bree and Dalton and Aaron all have those outcomes to prove, but you go to an insurance company, there's two things to me of the friction and Justin will weigh in heavily on this. There's a couple of things that really create friction for an insurance company when we talk about this outside of these piecemeal programs is um, loyalty of members. So they don't want, as much as this sounds ridiculous, they really don't want to invest in something that they think has a delayed return to them because they feel like those the, it's going to be a churn of members, right? And it's a point solution. So they, they don't really want to invest in that. Anything that benefit wise is difficult to define. It's a little bit loose. It feels difficult that you're only offering it to this group and not the other, you know, those types of things. It makes it hard. Um, wellness has gotten, this is the other, I think, really important for, thing for this group. And I saw it, I got bashed in the face with it earlier this week of a hospital CEO. So I, I want this group to hear this is wellness has a bad rap in the healthcare space. It's just seen as woo woo. It's seen as um, sexy, but not lucrative and fruitful and right. So we can't, it's gotta be, I know I hate using the term medicine around health, but it's right. So like when Aaron says reverse lifestyle disease, that's key. Um, but the, the biggest thing is not having a program that you say, this is the program and these are the outcomes. And this is how much we saved over 24 months or 12 months and it's scalable. So I think that's who's the struggle it? that- Because you're, you're, you're a human, hit. you have these issues, you go through it, you have outcomes, and we will figure out how to financially make sure you can get from point A to point B. Correct. So to me, right. So this group's- where we can really soar is figure out the way to scale it, put it in a program like ACO Reach, where it's a known program. It's you have all the data that CMS is providing that says, hey, this is how it's performing. It doesn't have to be ACO. We can talk about other things. Justin and I were talking about other ideas yesterday. It's just that you have we have to do this, in my opinion. In order for it to be adopted at the level that this group wants to see it adopted and to yield the kind of return that this group wants. I don't want to see this group get caught in a hamster wheel of point solution reimbursement. I don't want to see Aaron get paid some per member per month amount or some reimbursement for the pharmaceutical, you know, this farm, you know, food is farm, like the 1800, whatever, you know, what is it, Aaron, you said $3,000, $4,000 that the program costs. Yeah, I don't wanna see you get 3,000 or $4,000. I wanna see you get $50 per member per month on your population because you saved that. That, that do you know what I'm saying? Like that's the end game. And so, it ha so we have to take, basically we have to figure out a vehicle to take insurance risk, but to make it as low risk as possible. Yeah, I'll just hop, I'll just hop in on you, Katie. Your you know to your point, right? So right now, as, as it currently exists, right, the Medicaid space has the most flexibility in order to address and compensate for this issue, right? Ironically, um, yes. Right. So, and each state has its own you know network where I say fabric of how it comp compensates for things, but but and and Medicare does not. But you have some Medicare Advantage plans that Aaron's talking about that are like, hey, we can add this on as a supplemental yeah. benefit or those types of things. Yeah, I know Medicare the Massachusetts model of that. Yeah. 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 Medicare as a base has to cover this. Because what I was going to get at is insurance companies are good at following the rules some sometimes. But like if this is a rule, we've got to follow it. We've got to make sure that we're compliant with what the rule states. If you get creative in a one-off, they spend it, you spend a lot of time in kind of never never land trying to execute stuff that really isn't sustainable in the long term. So once that step is taken where you get the CPT codes group that you know, it's being talked about to be able to have Medicare actually cover for these services. Then you've got a wider swath of like, hey, we've got some standards here across, right? The danger in that, to Ellen's point, is all right, now we've got unit cost reimbursement for X, and it's going to keep getting cut year after year um, once you establish that base, right? It's just the reality. They're going to look at it, they're going to say, hey, so 
what Ellen and I are, and Dave are passionate about is like, okay, fine. Yes, that step has to be taken in order to say the government's paying for it. But now we've got to get some form of shared savings and upfront payments beyond that, that do not, that you're not reliant solely, solely upon that. Because again, a change healthcare situation happens and all of a sudden you're not getting paid, you know, those types of aspects where the system blows up. And if you're relying on this fee, you know, per unit or fee for service reimbursement, to get around that. And, and again, to Ellen's point, what we've been brainstorming is this ACO concept that will allow for us to have that flexibility. It's just a matter of where are we modeling out the financial savings and who's getting what, right? So it's a far more, what I'd say, in my perspective, a sustainable approach, um, but it's the direction that you want to go um, kind of longer term. So let me just dis describe for a second of what I think that reference architecture looks like a little bit. Um, and that is, if food is health is the issue, if the reason why people are sick is because they're not eating right in the extreme, then, then the right care delivery is to focus on food rather than, you don't need to touch healthcare to find out whether you have cancer. You need to find, touch healthcare to not go from pre-diabetic to diabetic. So that care delivery mechanism is probably something a lot different than talking to a PCP. It is a, a doctor. It is talking to, uh, let's sort of say, a lifestyle medicine-esque or an Aaron, or it's a, it's a different thing. And it may not even be a medical profession. It could very well be uh, Aaron may be a better person delivering a uh, diabetes avoidance uh, than anybody who went to medical school or anybody who will go to a new medical school. So so the, the model is, I think, leverage ACO to deliver a lifestyle medicine-esque or a food is health-esque solution that is not tied to one particular medical provider, but is- Well, but that's key. Just hold on, fundamentally. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just get through this a little bit. It's not necessarily tied to a, a core institution, but is more tied to the food is health side of it and that delivery mechanism, and that it provides economic incentives to to grow it and and shape it and make it better. Um, and I think I may have lost the rest of my lost my point, but let make a go ahead with your point, Ellen. Well, the unfortunate part about it is that we do have to have a, a traditional primary care physician that participates in Medicare in this example. It would have to be something in a health plan if it were to be an ACO with a health plan, for example. We do have to have a physician that that person is aligning to. Can't so, align me, to a dietitian. Me, you, so, you, brought up, you brought up what I left out is so, so when we think about even in that position and how that delivered and we think about food is health that the it might be that the empathy component the connectivity component the customer success component is more Aaron and the technical component of you know I need to read your blood work and answer this question about your blood work and do this that actually might uh, that that solution might be telehealth uh, and I know the telehealth's got various problems but it it all of a sudden, if you're thinking about the reference architecture and you say that the success is not, am I the smartest person in the world with the best healthcare? Success is a patient willingly adopting the practices that lead to better health. And that success might be more about customer success and empathy than it is about, I went to Harvard Medical School. And if you start rethinking the reference architecture from that standpoint, and you bring in the expertise of, well, an ACO has to have a PCP, but nobody says they have to be five minutes from your door. They could be at ARH in a data center, and maybe they're a bot. I, again, I'm, I'm not trying to like dehumanize this, but the last time I was in medical care, I got more correct information out of OpenAI than I did the doctor. <laughs> um, well, then, the Carter, to your point, I get more information from a functional nutritionist that I work with who doesn't cost me much money at all who has massive force multiplier effects in my life. Um, she's not a medical doctor, 
you know, and, and, and you don't have to see, and Katie and Carter, you don't have to see the doctor I'm talking about. And yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, Carter, that like Justin and I were talking yesterday and we've talked about this before. Honestly, what I would love, because I feel like this whole thing we're talking about is not just a solution of reversing lifestyle disease. It could be a rural health desert solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to right, so it's the food desert and the health desert that exists in rural America. To me, if we create a scalable model here and you do leverage virtual telehealth, for example, and virtual primary care, I agree with you, Carter. You don't need a to go to a bricks and mortar clinic for any of this. What you need is to go to a frigging kitchen to have somebody to teach you to cook. Like and that's reliable more internet. Reliable internet is a like yeah, and a with- lab and a lab to get some lab work done, you know. And like so, we've actually talked to a couple of telehealth companies because they haven't traditionally had primary care to where it's who you attribute as your primary care physician. They're typically the extension of a primary care. So we've kicked around: could we make virtual? right the center of this and so like justin has said could we partner with rural health like federally qualified health centers fqhcs and rhcs for example i'm getting very technical but my point is i agree exactly with what you're saying and what katie what you were saying like it is a new and here's the key it is a new care delivery model not just a prescription for food and that that to me is the language and this it's like a system not just um not just a point solution yeah. not just so a aaron so we hold on we've been in this area aaron do you want to well i also want to make sure we're hearing from so like david and eva and yeah, Steve, who we haven't heard from yet i'd really like to hear what you guys are thinking i really know I'm, I'm listening in and enjoying it and you know we're executing the <laughs> medic medicaid program in california and and um, had a chance to go to several conferences over the last three or four weeks that that were wildly different in what execution looks like, right? And that's I think one of the reasons why we're here talking about it. So I was I was at the Milk and Global conference, and of course that was all, all investors and talking about you know all these opportunities in the in the industry. And then I was at a California convention regarding you know the medically tailored meal and grocery program and then um, was at the food is medicine summit chicago earlier this week and what what i found kind of interesting is is no one was really talking about the actual intervention whether it's a frozen meal fresh fruits and vegetables etc and nobody was talking about where they were sourcing those items and, and how they were sourcing those so i appreciate aaron's points about you know working together with local local farmers and and we've seen that to be really compelling especially in the rural communities we're working in as, as these farmers and then people who are on the other side who are into these kinds of benefits typically don't um, uh, sit at the same table if you will and creating opportunity for farmers as uh, you know and becoming a meaningful customer an offtake the customer to a farmer is huge. How do you do that? You got to get to scale, right? And how do you get to scale by trying to, you know, you push this program out to as many people as you can. So it's kind of the chicken or the egg. And then I think another thing that I, I noticed was a, a, a huge um, focus on nonprofits delivering these benefits. Um, and then the, and then the, and I learned from a lot of the nonprofits, the inherent challenges that, that come along with it. And I think Carter mentioned it, you know, you get caught up in a reimbursement hack, or maybe that was to Justin that brought it up and we were part of that and didn't get paid for 120 days. And, and you know, we have the luxury of using our, ba- our balance sheet to be able to get us through those times where, you know, nonprofits just can't. And then we, I found that several nonprofits too, who, who, as they started building out these capabilities, you know, pretty soon it gets far afield of what the nonprofit was was created to to do, and so um, I just find that kind of unique. Um, I, I think there's it's going to take um, collaboration among all groups. There's no like winner or loser in this, which is unique coming from the agriculture business. It's a zero sum game typically. For me to win, you have to lose on a transaction. That's just the way our system is set up. And to come into an environment where there's way more collaboration is really refreshing. Um, but you know, challenges exist as we we look to expand into other states and other other you know areas, including private payers and and commercial. And I appreciate what what Katie had to say about the cost and Ellen too. And and somebody at the conference it was a it was a 
a payer and they said the math has to math and I love it. So I'm going to steal that line um, because, you know, it's one thing when it's a government provided program, it's a whole nother thing when you're trying to get corporates involved and, and focusing on the health of the 125 to 150 million of us that get our health care from our, from our employer. We have to start calling farmers that are growing food for actual nutrition, something different. I mean, we keep saying farmers in America, that word means a lot of different things. And a lot of farmers don't grow food. Well, that's Debbie. So, Debbie do, <laughs> I, I, I feel like we should be calling them like nutrition farmers or, or started to call farmers people who grow nutritious food. But the other like farmers that don't somehow, I, I don't think we're, it's such a, it's becoming such a strange misnomer in this conversation. And, and we're starting to see, you know, I, I'm a lifelong member of the fresh produce industry and, and that's been kind of how we've been able to scale just knowing the local food systems across the U.S. We're finally getting to the point, and I've been telling these these farmers and growers and producers and shippers, we call them, like, you want to be in this box. I mean, like, why, why wouldn't you, you know, support this program? We're buying this produce from you and paying you a, a fair price, probably higher than what they're getting from retailers, and and allowing for them to, you know, if I was them, I'd be screaming from the mountaintops that my, my product is being prescribed as medicine. I'm not sure about what my neighbor's is. And so we're starting to see a little bit of that. But again, that comes with scale. You know, the, the person I buy my strawberries from, we buy a load of strawberries a week, and the company ships 100 100 loads a day you know so we're like a nuisance customer at this point so we're, we call in they're like oh only one load okay here you know it's kind of a, a pain in the butt to get it picked up and so it just kind of shows like the the nascence you know the, the infancy that we are in this program and how the fresh fruit and vegetable industry specifically you know needs to step up and 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 you know have a seat at the table and as you mentioned there's not many other produce farmers on the on the call and and that's indicative i went to that food I, in those three in those three conferences there was probably five people in from the fresh fruit and vegetable supply chain combined at those three conferences i went to so um they still haven't gotten it yet yeah and we so don't have more farmers and hold on a second justin debbie you want to introduce yourself and 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 add to katie's comment so i'm debbie borg and i am in um, the middle of the country center of everything in nebraska so we are the um, I'm not sure what you want to call us now because I grow corn and soybeans um, and we feed cattle. We also, and most of the corn that we grow is fed to the cattle that we feed on our place. In addition to, we raise the alfalfa to feed them, um, but they are uh, sold to Cargill, JBS, Greater Omaha. Um, and then we also grow chickens for Costco. And that's why I'm late because I was in the chicken barns this morning. Um, and all of the feed that goes into those chickens is sourced within about 50 miles of Nebraska, of Fremont, Nebraska. How many chickens do you grow at any one time? I'm just a backyard farmer, Carter. I've said this many times, uh, but my backyard's big. And so we're, we're caring for 60,000 birds every day. Wow. It's a big backyard. It is. Well, my kids had a really big, big <laughs> sandbox too so we have light soils but on the flip side on the farming um i married into the into this farm um so we're fifth generation and we've been no-tilling my husband's been no-tilling before it was cool so about 40 years is how long we've been no-tilling and we rotate um predominantly all of our acres are corn soybeans back to back outside of um, silage acres sometimes due to distance to farm. So. And so we, so I'll do another point here is when we're talking about farming, there's row crop, there's right. rural Nebraska and rural California. There is, right. there are shifts going on, even in uh, especially crops or fruits and vegetables, where a lot of that's moving out of California and moving down to South America for a, a gazillion different reasons. And so there's a lot, the board is moving around a lot, and um, which is another reason why this is an interesting topic today. Um, Debbie, can you add anything just about rural health? Like, where are you, what's, the, what's going on in rural health and rural mm -hmm. grocery? So, um, my address is Allen, which is on the map, but Wakefield is where my kids went to school and their class size is between 30 and 40 kids. So we've got a total of about 550 kids in our K through 12. 
Um, we are a we are now, I think it's 57% mainly Hispanic, um, the remaining white. We have a large egg facility in our town along with several dairies. So our um they their food reimbursement is based on those eligible for free lunches, although I think there's been everybody's gotten free lunches for quite a while. So um, they've been doing uh, summer lunches through COVID. So, our, you know, listening to these issues, I really think it's because kids don't, I mean, nobody's taught how to cook. So I'm a traditionalist. I grew up in a household where I learned to cook clean and sew. Um, and was shocked when I met people who didn't know how to cook. But um, the I think, you know, we called it FHA, tells you my age. Um, and now I can't tell you what the food consumer science, but I don't think there's any nutrition teaching in our schools anymore, let alone how to cook a meal. Now, the USDA will tell you that the MyPlate platform is everywhere and that they're teaching it everywhere. And it does, it's in kids' backpacks. How much they pay attention to it, I don't know, but my plate is certainly a big push on their part. So we've got about right. 15 more minutes here. Uh, Debbie, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I, the, the rural health, I mean, I, I used a um, Christian MediShare program for the previous six years and it was phenomenal. <laughs> um, and we do have a, a doc, uh, doctor's office in our small town and there's I think three different doctors at service and it's open pretty much eight to five every day so and I'm a half an hour from Sioux City two hours from Omaha so I do have access to um, good care but when you mention the food desert you know that kind of drives me crazy in that um People will drive 30 minutes to go work out. Why won't they drive 30 minutes to go get fresh food? I don't know. Uh, we do not have, we had a grocery store in our town. Um, it probably closed 10 years ago. And now we have Dollar General. And if you guys have been through the, the Midwest, Dollar General has quite a system of success because they're in every small town. And there's been talk about fresh food there. But right now it's totally processed and boxed. And it is um, a lifeline for a lot of our community members because a lot of the Hispanic women don't drive. Oh, interesting. David, uh, Lizax, you got to Oh, so much. Um, where to start? My... My interest here is really around how how we begin to change the conversation around the broader economics of both health and food. Um, I come more from the environmental science and have moved into the health side. And I'm happy to share some of the work that we just finished up with support from USDA around identifying a set of value propositions around food that are generally outside of the market right now. So if food is, is you know, mainly priced around you know, thing, aspects like quanti uh, uh, quantity, how big, yield, you know, the, you know, on the produce side, whether it is, you know, color or shape or size, what, what isn't embedded in a lot of the conversations or the market transactions around food is around nutritional quality, nutrient density, uh, effects on landscapes, short-term and long-term uh, health effects on people. And these are the conversations that I think, you know, are, you know, I think many folks here are beginning to weave together so we can kind of, you know, I think in the, at least in the long term goal is from you know, my career and whatever happens after that of what does it look like when we have more regenerative systems that are more profitable than, uh, you know, some of the some of the other systems out there and similarly where we have healthcare is going to be more profitable than sick care. And I think flipping both those systems simultaneously is where the direction of this, I think the reference architecture, Carter, that you referenced and drafted out, um, you know, in the outline is at least in my mind, that's my interpretation of it is, is, you know, I think it's the, 
the basic economics in today's version of late stage capitalism and the drive towards profit in the short term really is not, I would say, in alignment with the ecological foundations of either what's happening in our bodies and our microbiota and, and or what's happening on the farms and in the soils. And so for me, it's trying to connect these conversations about ACOs, which I am generally new to, um, you know, back to my understanding around how ecology works and how we begin to, you know, shift our, our, our economic frames so that the outcomes that I think we're all here for become, you know, part of the market and the market tra transaction, you know, never want to leave policy out of the room. And, and, you know, given that so much of both our health and ag policy is, you know, coming from Washington or, uh, places close to it it's you know where in, in some cases you know quoting I, I think it comes from Cory Booker maybe somebody else is that you know policy comes to Washington not from Washington or Washington or at least it should um, and so thinking about at least from a capital perspective whether it be venture capital philanthropy you know other types of of instruments of how some of these systems that we're talking about can be demonstrated, trialed, scaled outside of a policy context, and then, you know, using the lessons and the learnings and the data and the result and the tangible results of people who have lost 160 pounds and who have gotten healthy and have reversed a number of diseases, that becomes the policy platform, you know, to build both maybe the next farm bill and, you know, the next iteration of, you know, I think, some of our health uh, health legislation. So that's that's my frame, big term, and I'm happy to share some of the documents that we've been working on in some of these frameworks. But but I'm you're spending, I, finding my place in all the in these. Broader. I really I agree with you, David. I like I that to me is the key is is having a platform to demonstrate the results because I think that'll really help the political platform as well to be able to say, look, this is it's not just a study. Like here's a bunch of Medicare beneficiaries. And look what we saved, you know. Derek, walk him into the congressional wanna, offices. Want to make sure, like in the next, I mean, we're coming down to like not a lot of time left, but and I wouldn't mind stealing like two minutes at the end here. But Derek, you want to, you you got anything to add here? Would no, I know I really appreciate be, being here. This is uh, something new for me. I'm coming from a perspective where I, uh, just like you, Carter, come across a lot of companies who want to get into this food as medicine, food as me medicine space. My, my concern is if we are not all connected and on the same page, it might become a big uh, boom from a perspective of, uh, you know, a, 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 a hot topic without creating a real value. So I would love to be connected early on, see what everybody else is doing and how can we work together to actually create a system which, which is more sustainable rather than everybody working with their own piece. Yep. Good. Uh, Dalton, did you have anything else? That you'd spoken up earlier, but do you have anything else to add here at the end? No, I don't think so, Carter. Uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on this call with all of these uh, absolutely, um, you know, impressive individuals and, and learning about what everyone's doing. Right. And Dave, uh, did you have anything else or anybody else have anything else you just want to raise? I, I do not. Thanks, though. Thanks for putting it together, Carter. I, I have something real quick, Carter. Carter we're talking yeah. about rural health, rural health, and we have the opportunity to work in high density areas like Los Angeles County and Orange County, but but also Imperial County, which is probably the most challenged county in California, it's far south southeastern corner where we're based up against the Mexican border and the Arizona border. And that population mirrors what Debbie was mentioning in terms of demographic and it, we have a team of registered dietitians that work on intake. And when we started serving Imperial County, there was a noticeable difference. I mean, our, our, my, our lead RDN called me and said, wow, this is like, I can tell almost when people call in what county they're from um, and the preponderance of obesity and diabetes. And, and one thing that's really ironic is Imperial County where, you know, 75% of the winter vegetables are grown from uh, November to March 
um, and the migrant farm workers that harvest these crops don't have access to these fresh fruits and vegetables. And there's food deserts in the middle of the freaking salad bowl of the United States. Oh. And so finding actual systems to be able to deliver in rural under a rural construct, and as opposed to going into Los Angeles where the van only has to drive around 20 miles, you know, and, and then now we're in an area where there's 15,000 population cities that are 20, 30 miles apart spread out in a large county. Um, really, it's interesting to not only note the operational challenges, but the health challenges are, are really specific to the counties that we're in. And I, I find that amazing. Cool. Okay. So we got like five minutes left here and I just, and I'm not uh, positive what to do next, but um, the objective, we pulled this together because a lot of, we were seeing a lot of different things and need to pull it together. The, I've inserted this concept called reference architecture, which just comes from my history of technology development, sort of like here's how it's all going to sort of come together. And we're going to have a whole bunch of strong teams around that that are going to sort of architect themselves around that that design concept and solve for it. And and how they solve might be completely different than I think should be solved or or Katie thinks needs to be solved or whatever. Um, what I might roughly propose and i'd love people to just send me because we're gonna run out of time here or send me your thoughts afterwards is this sort of started through a combination of conversations between me katie alan and aaron i maybe left somebody out and eva i didn't ask you to did you have anything you wanted to add i'm sorry yeah no um i don't think i have a lot to add at this point i'm really taking it all in and absorbing um you know through my background with iSelect for many years working in the innovation space. I also have a background in community building and then a long background in advocacy with Alzheimer's. So I think for me, I'm really looking for what are the disconnects? What are the, what are the pieces that we need to actions that we can take small actions to start moving in the right direction? Um, one idea I have potentially is to send out a survey to everybody after the uh, call and sort of get some feedback on what do you think are the disconnects, what are the biggest challenges and sort of circulate that and see if we can come up with any actions that we can take coming out of that. But I really see the value in having this, getting everybody together and sharing and, and learning about what everybody's doing in their different silos. So I appreciate being here. Great. So um, I sort of feel like uh, the reference architecture, improving it, articulating it, making it public gives a sense for other people to say, I'm working on my thing and I'm excited about that because I can see how my thing connects to there. It gives me group energy. So uh, a way I've thought about this is to have some similar sessions like this, building on it, describing and building out that reference architecture amongst people who are sort of working in the area to try to make it stronger that make this visible to other people so we can draw them in, which um, we have recorded this. I personally would like to put it, frankly, share the recording with anybody who wants to see it. Is anybody opposed to that? I never want to record something. And so, okay, so if we share it on YouTube and and then you guys share it out to whoever, that's cool. Um, I would, I'm also sort of just as a little bit of how we're using tech. I'd be interested in in start working towards the reference architecture. I'm only one person. Eva's only one person. Katie's only one person. If anyone else here is willing to give some of their time to help with a part of an effort to try to pull this together, we I've added a WhatsApp channel to here. I will email everybody the WhatsApp channel. Join that WhatsApp channel. But if you're if you're open to helping try to organize this disparate group say i'm willing to help this is my superpower i'm willing to help in this regard and pull this thing together and then that'll help us figure things out i sort of feel like doing this kind of session every few weeks or something around a topic and this is how we're building in this area and using it sort of as an open kind of webinar format so to speak of a group to sort of help draw in more people and draw in more of a community around the thinking about how we can architect this uh, might be a way to go forward. That's like walking out of this meeting today that feels like a way to get more information discovery and get some more coalition building. Um, so I'm sort of leaning in that direction. If you think there's a better way to do this or you've got other experience on how to pull things together, why don't you share that on the WhatsApp channel? Um, 
And also, Carter, you know, the WhatsApp channel, though, doesn't allow us to track something sort of as a as a comprehensive visual. I, I wish there was some place we could go on and kind of like add our thinking to an actual reference, a visual reference architecture. We could create, I mean, I'm, we're, we have a share file that, that I'm, I'm putting Dave on the spot, but I mean, I'm sure we could create a shared I'm not a fan of Google Docs. If everybody wants to use that, yeah. we can. But like, mm -hmm. I could create like I hate PowerPoint. I know, but it works. Um, whatever document you want to use. But if it's any of the Microsoft things, I mean, we could create a document and put it on a share file and send everybody the link, and everybody could just at lib work. So we, on it. Let's let's talk through this a little bit about the best of shared environment. Yeah. Um, Maybe Miro. Yeah. Miro is not a bad idea. Yeah. All right, Dave. Would it be helpful to go into the reference framework document and add comments and content? I'm looking at it and I was like, oh, what about this? What about that? Would that you be should be able to, to. If you can't, just ask for permission. And do you, you want us to? Would that yeah, be yeah. Helpful? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry. That was That is just me last night over an hour. Got it. It is, it is as raw as it can be and is the opinion of me. <laughs> it's collective of various things, but please absolutely... And ask for edit rights. I just don't, if you get edit rights, feel free to just sort of tweak it and fix my. I, yeah. I might just put in a bunch of comments. And add comments. So I think you should be able to invite yourself to it. I believe I'm putting her a little bit on the spot. Katie has students that love to dig in and help. <laughs> so um, I think so. we have a capability of a little bit of elastic capacity out of Friedman of people that are also sort of willing to shadow any one of our efforts and maybe pick up some responsibility and may even have research they're working on that yeah. benefits from connecting to the communities you control. Um, so I gotta go. all right, right. we will schedule another meeting in the immediate future, comment on the WhatsApp group as to what we should be doing and we will make this better. Thank you for everybody's input. Thanks, Carter. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks, Carter, for pulling it together. Bye. Bye.